night not catastrophic, but merely background, the perennial last scented spring of youth. And Judith not there, and Henry the Romantic not there, and Bon the Fatalist, hidden somewhere, the Watcher and the Watched. And the recurrent flower-laden dawns of that April and May and June filled with bugles, enter in a hundred windows where a hundred still unbridled widows dreamed virgin unmeditant upon the locks of black or brown or yellow hair, and Judith not one of these. And five of the company, mounted with grooms and body servants in a forage wagon, in their new and unstained gray, made a tour of the state with the flag, the company's colors, the segments of silk cut and fitted but not sewn, from house to house, until the sweetheart of each man in the company had taken a few stitches in it, and Henry and Bond not of these either, since they did not join the company until after it departed who must have emerged from whatever place it was that they lurked in, emerging as though unnoticed from the roadside break or thicket, to fall in as the marching company passed. The two of them, the youth and the man, the youth deprived twice now of his birthright, who should have made one among the candles and fiddles, the kisses and the desperate tears, who should have made one of the color god itself which toured the state with the unsown flag and the man who should not have been there at all, who was too old to be there at all, both in years and experience, that mental and spiritual orphan whose fate it apparently was to exist in some limbo, halfway between where his corporeality was and his mentality and moral equipment desired to be, an undergraduate at the university, yet by the sheer accumulation of two full years behind him, forced into the extra-academic of a law class containing six members. In the war, by that same force, removed into the isolation of commissioned rank. He received a lieutenancy before the company entered its first engagement, even. I don't think he wanted it. I can even imagine him trying to avoid it, refuse it. But there it was, he was, orphaned once more by the very situation to which and by which he was doomed. The two of them officer and man now, but still watcher and watched, waiting for something, but not knowing what. What act of fate, destiny, what irrevocable sentence of what judge or arbiter between them, since nothing less would do, nothing halfway or reversible would seem to suffice. The officer, the lieutenant, who possessed the slight and authorized advantage of being able to say, You go there of at least sometimes remaining behind the platoon which he directed. The private who carried that officer shot through the shoulder on his back while the regiment fell back under the Yankee guns at Pittsburgh Landing, carried him to safety apparently for the sole purpose of watching him for two years more. Writing Judith, meanwhile, that they were both alive, and that was all. And Judith, she lived alone now. Perhaps she had lived alone ever since that Christmas day last year, and then year before last, and then three years, and then four years ago, since though Sutpen was gone now with his and Sartorius's regiment, and the Negroes, the wild stock with which he had created Sutpen's hundred, had followed the first Yankee troops to pass through Jefferson, she lived in anything but solitude, what with Ellen in bed in the shuttered room requiring the unremitting attention of a child while she waited with that amazed and passive uncomprehension to die. And she, Judith, and Clyde making and keeping a kitchen garden of sorts to keep them alive, and Wash Jones living in the abandoned and rotting fishing camp in the river bottom which Sutpen had built after the first woman, Ellen, entered his house and the last deer and bear hunter went out of it where he now permitted Wash and his daughter and infant granddaughter to live, performing the heavy garden work and supplying Ellen and Judith and then Judith with fish and game now and then, even entering the house now, who until Sutpen went away had never approached nearer than the Scuppernong arbor behind the kitchen, where on Sunday afternoons he and Sutpen would drink from the demijohn and the bucket of spring water which Wash fetched from almost a mile away, Sutpen in the barrel stave hammock, talking, and Wash squatting against a post, chortling and guffawing. Not solitude and certainly not idleness. The same impenetrable and serene face, only a little older now, a little thinner now, 
which had appeared in town in the carriage beside her father's within a week after it was learned that her fiancé and her brother had quitted the house in the night and vanished, none knew why or where, and none asked. Just as now none asked when she came to town now, in the made-over dress which all southern women now wore. In the carriage still, but drawn now by a mule, a plough-mule, Soon the plough-mule, and no coachman to drive it either, to put the mule in the harness and take it out, to join the other women where there were wounded in Jefferson then, in the improvised hospital where the nurtured virgin, the supremely and traditionally idle, they cleaned and dressed the self-fouled bodies of strange injured and dead, and made lint of the window curtains and sheets and linen of the houses in which they had been born. None to ask her about brother and sweetheart while they talked among themselves of sons and brothers and husbands, with tears and grief perhaps, but at least with certainty, knowledge. She wakened too, like Henry and Bon, not knowing for what, but unlike Henry and Bon, she not even knowing for why. Then Ellen died, the butterfly of a forgotten summer two years defunctive now the substanceless shell, the shade impervious to any alteration or dissolution because of its very weightlessness. No body to be buried, just the shape, the recollection, translated on some peaceful afternoon without bell or catafalque into that cedar grove, to lie in powder-light paradox beneath the thousand pounds of marble monument which Sutpen, Colonel Sutpen now, since Sartorus had been deposed at the annual election of regimental officers the year before, brought in the regimental forage wagon from Charleston, South Carolina, and set above the faint grassy depression which Judith told him was Ellen's grave. And then her grandfather died, starved to death, nailed up in his own attic, and Judith doubtless inviting Miss Rosa to come out to Sutpen's hundred to live, and Miss Rosa declining. Waiting, too, apparently upon this letter, this first direct word from Bon in four years, and which, a week after she buried him, too, beside her mother's tombstone, she brought to town herself, in the surrey drawn by the mule which both she and Clytie had learned to catch and harness, and gave to your grandmother, bringing the letter voluntarily to your grandmother, who, Judith, never called on anyone now, had no friends now, doubtless knowing no more why she chose your grandmother to give the letter to than your grandmother knew. Not thin now, but gaunt, the Sutpen skull showing indeed now through the worn, the cold field flesh, the face which had long since forgotten how to be young, and yet absolutely impenetrable, absolutely serene. No mourning, not even grief. And your grandmother saying, Me? You want me to keep it? Yes, Judith said, or destroy it, as you like. Read it if you like, or don't read it if you like. Because you make so little impression, you see. You get born, and you try this, and you don't know why, only you keep on trying it, and you are born at the same time with a lot of other people, all mixed up with them, like trying to, having to, move your arms and legs with strings, only the same strings are hitched to all the other arms and legs. And the others all trying, and they don't know why either, except that the strings are all in one another's way, like five or six people all trying to make a rug on the same loom, only each one wants to weave his own pattern into the rug. And it can't matter, you know that, or the ones that set up the loom would have arranged things a little better, and yet it must matter, because you keep on trying, or having to keep on trying. And then all of a sudden it's all over, and all you have left is a block of stone with scratches on it, provided there was someone to remember to have the marble scratched and set up, or had time to. And it rains on it, and the sun shines on it, and after a while they don't even remember the name and what the scratches were trying to tell, and it doesn't matter. So maybe if you could go to someone, the stranger the better, and give them something, a scrap of paper, something, anything— it not meant to mean anything in itself, and them not even to read it or keep it, not even bother to throw it away or destroy it. At least it would be something just because it would have happened. Be remembered, even if only from passing from one hand to another, one mind to another. And it would be at least a scratch, something, something that might make a mark on something that was once for the reason that it can die some day, or the block of stone can't be is, because it can never become was, because it can't ever die or perish. 
and your grandmother watching her, the impenetrable, the calm, the absolutely serene face, and crying, No, no, not that. Think of your... And the face watching her, comprehending, still serene, not even bitter. Oh, I? No, not that. Because somebody will have to take care of Clatty and Father too soon, who will want something to eat after he comes home, because it won't last much longer since they have begun to shoot one another now. No, not that. Women don't do that for love. I don't even believe that men do, and not now, anyway, because there wouldn't be any room now for them to go to wherever it is, if it is. It would be full already, glutted, like a theater, an opera house, if what you expect to find is forgetting, diversion, entertainment, like a bed already too full if what you want to find is a chance to lie still and sleep and sleep and sleep. Mr. Compson moved. Half rising, Quentin took the letter from him and beneath the dim, bug-fouled globe opened it, carefully, as though the sheet, the desiccated square, were not the paper but the intact ash of its former shape and substance. And meanwhile, Mr. Compson's voice speaking on while Quentin heard it without listening. Now you can see why I said that he loved her, because there were other letters, many of them, gallant, flowery, indolent, frequent, and insincere, sent by hand over that forty miles between Oxford and Jefferson after that first Christmas. The metropolitan gallants, idle and delicately flattering, and doubtless to him meaningless, gesture to the bucolic maiden. And that bucolic maiden, with that profound and absolutely inexplicable, tranquil, patient clairvoyance of women— against which that metropolitan gallant's foppish posturing was just the jackanape antics of a small boy. Receiving the letters without understanding them, not even keeping them, for all their elegant and gallant and tediously contrived turns of form and metaphor, until the next one arrived. But keeping this one, which must have reached her out of a clear sky after an interval of four years, considering this one worthy to give to a stranger to keep or not to keep, even to read or not to read as the stranger saw fit, to make that scratch, that undying mark on the blank face of the oblivion to which we are all doomed, of which she spoke. Quentin, hearing, without having to listen as he read the faint spidery script, not like something impressed upon the paper by a once-living hand, but like a shadow cast upon it which had resolved on the paper the instant before he looked at it, and which might fade, vanish, at any instant, while he still did. The dead tongue speaking after the four years, and then after almost fifty more, gentle, sardonic, whimsical, and incurably pessimistic, without date or salutation or signature. You will notice how I insult neither of us by claiming this to be a voice from the defeated even, let alone from the dead. In fact, if I were a philosopher, I should deduce and derive a curious and apt commentary on the times and augur of the future from this letter which you now hold in your hands, a sheet of notepaper with, as you can see, the best of French watermarks dated seventy years ago, salvaged, stolen, if you will, from the gutted mansion of a ruined aristocrat, and written upon in the best of stove polish manufactured not twelve months ago in a New England factory. Yes, stove polish. We captured it. A story in itself. Imagine us, an assortment of homogeneous scarecrows, I won't say hungry, because to a woman, lady or female either, below Masons and Dixons in this year of grace, 1865, that word would be sheer redundancy, like saying we were breathing. And I won't say ragged or even shoeless, since we have been both long enough to have grown accustomed to it, only, thank God, and this restores my faith not in human nature, perhaps, but at least in man, that he really does not become inured to hardship and privation. It is only the mind, the gross, omnivorous, carrion heavy soul, which becomes inured. The body itself, thank God, never reconciled from the old soft feel of soap and clean linen, and something between the sole of the foot and the earth to distinguish it from the foot of a beast. So say we merely needed ammunition— and imagine us, the scarecrows, with one of those concocted plans of scarecrow desperation which not only must but do work, 
for the reason that there is absolutely no room for alternative before man or heaven, no niche on earth or under it for failure, to find space either to pause or breathe or be graved and sepulchred. And we, the scarecrows, bringing it off with a great deal of elan, not to say noise. Imagine, I say, the prey and prize, the ten plump, defenseless sutler's wagons, the scarecrows tumbling out box after beautiful box after beautiful box, stenciled each with that U and that S, which for four years now has been to us the symbol of the spoils which belong to the vanquished, of the loaves and the fishes, as was once the incandescent brow, the shining nimbus of the thorny crown, and the scarecrows clawing at the boxes with stones and bayonets and even with bare hands, and opening them at last and finding, what? Stove polish. Gallons and gallons and gallons of the best stove polish. Not a box of it a year old yet, and doubtless still trying to overtake General Sherman with some belated amended field order requiring him to polish the stove before firing the house. How we laughed. Yes, we laughed, because I have learned this at least during these four years, that it really requires an empty stomach to laugh with that only when you are hungry or frightened do you extract some ultimate essence out of laughing just as the empty stomach extracts the ultimate essence out of alcohol. But at least we have stove polish. We have plenty of it. We have too much, because it does not take much to say what I have to say, as you can see. And so the conclusion and augury which I draw, even though no philosopher, is this. We have waited long enough. You will notice how I do not insult you either by saying I have waited long enough. And therefore, since I do not insult you by saying that only I have waited, I do not add, expect me, because I cannot say when to expect me, because what was is one thing. And now it is not because it is dead. It died in 1861, and therefore what is... There, they have started firing again which, to mention it, is redundancy too, like the breathing or the need of ammunition, because sometimes I think it has never stopped. It hasn't stopped, of course, I don't mean that. I mean there has never been any more of it. That there was that one fusillade four years ago which sounded once and then was arrested, mesmerized, raised muzzle by raised muzzle, in the frozen attitude of its own aghast amazement, and never repeated, and it now only the loud, aghast echo jarred by the dropped musket of a weary sentry or by the fall of the spent body itself, out of the air which lies over the land where that fusillade first sounded, and where it must remain yet because no other space under heaven will receive it. So that means it is dawn again and that I must stop. Stop what, you will say? Why, thinking, remembering, remark that I do not say, hoping, to become once more for a period without boundaries or location in time, mindless and irrational companion and inmate of a body which, even after four years, with a sort of dismal and incorruptible fidelity which is incredibly admirable to me, is still immersed and obliviously bemused in recollections of old peace and contentment, the very names of whose sense and sounds I do not know that I remember which ignores even the presence and threat of a torn arm or leg as though through some secretly incurred and infallible promise and conviction of immortality. But to finish, I cannot say when to expect me, because what is is something else again, because it was not even alive then. And since because within this sheet of paper you now hold the best of the old South, which is dead, and the words you read were written upon it with the best, each box said the very best, of the new north which has conquered and which therefore, whether it likes it or not, will have to survive, I now believe that you and I are, strangely enough, included among those who are doomed to live. And that's all, Mr. Compson said. She received it, and she and Clatty made the wedding gown and the veil from scraps, perhaps scraps intended for, which should have gone for, lint, and did not. She didn't know when he would come, because he didn't know himself. And maybe he told Henry, showed Henry the letter before he sent it, and maybe he did not. 
maybe still just the watching and the waiting, the one saying to Henry, I have waited long enough, and Henry saying to the other, Do you renounce, then? Do you renounce? And the other saying, I do not renounce. For four years now I have given chance the opportunity to renounce for me, but it seems that I am doomed to live, that she and I both are doomed to live. The defiance and the ultimatum delivered beside a bivouac fire, the ultimatum discharged before the gate to which the two of them must have written side by side almost. The one calm and undeviating, perhaps unresistant even, the fatalist to the last, the other remorseless with implacable and unalterable grief and despair. It seemed to Quentin that he could actually see them, facing one another at the gate. Inside the gate, what was once a park, now spread, unkempt, in shaggy desolation, with an air dreamy, remote, and aghast, like the unshaven face of a man just waking from ether, up to a huge house where a young girl waited in a wedding dress made from stolen scraps, the house partaking too of that air of scaling desolation, not having suffered from invasion but a shell marooned and forgotten in a backwater of catastrophe, a skeleton giving of itself in slow driblets of furniture and carpet, linen and silver, to help to die torn and anguished men who knew even while dying that for months now the sacrifice and the anguish were in vain. They faced one another on the two gaunt horses, two men, young, not yet in the world, not yet breathed over long enough to be old, but with old eyes, with unkempt hair and faces gaunt and weathered as if cast by some spartan and even niggard hand from bronze, in worn and patched gray, weathered now to the color of dead leaves, the one with the tarnished braid of an officer, the other plain of cuff, the pistol lying yet across the saddle-bow unaimed the two faces calm, the voices not even raised. Don't you pass the shadow of this post, this branch, Charles, and I am going to pass it, Henry. And then Wash Jones, sitting that saddleless mule before Miss Rose's gate, shouting her name into the sunny and peaceful quiet of the street, saying, Are you Rosa Coldfield? Then you better come on out, yon. Henry has done shot that dern French fellow. Killed him dead as a beef. Chapter 5 So they will have told you doubtless already how I told that Jones to take that mule, which was not his, around to the barn, and harness it to our buggy while I put on my hat and shawl and locked the house. That was all I needed to do, since they will have told you doubtless that I would have had no need for either trunk or bag, since what clothing I possessed— now that the garments which I had been fortunate enough to inherit from my aunt's kindness or haste or oversight were long since worn out, consisted of the ones which Ellen had remembered from time to time to give me, and now Ellen these two years dead, that I had only to lock the house and take my place in the buggy and traverse those twelve miles which I had not done since Ellen died. Beside that brute who until Ellen died was not even permitted to approach the house from the front— that brute progenitor of brutes whose granddaughter was to supplant me, if not in my sister's house, at least in my sister's bed, to which, so they will tell you, I aspired. That brute who, brute instrument of that justice which presides over human events, which, incept in the individual, runs smooth, less claw than velvet, but which by man or woman flouted drives on like fiery steel and overrides both weakly just and unjust strong, both vanquisher and innocent victimized, ruthless for appointed right and truth. Brute, who was not only to preside upon the various shapes and avatars of Thomas Sutpen's devil's fate, but was to provide at the last the female flesh in which his name and lineage should be sepulchred. That brute who appeared to believe that he had served and performed his appointed end by yelling of blood and pistols in the street before my house, who seemed to believe that what further information he might have given me was too scant or too bland and free of moment to warrant the discarding of his tobacco cud, because during the entire subsequent twelve miles he could not even tell me what had happened, and how I traversed those same twelve miles once more after the two years since Ellen died, or was it the four years since Henry vanished, or was it the nineteen years since I saw light and breathed? Knowing nothing, able to learn nothing save this, 
a shot heard faint and far away and even direction and source indeterminate, by two women, two young women alone in a rotting house where no man's footstep had sounded in two years. A shot, then an interval of a ghast surmise above the cloth and needles which engaged them. Then feet in the hall and then on the stairs, running, hurrying, the feet of a man. And Judith with just time to snatch up the unfinished dress and hold it before her as the door burst open upon her brother the wild murderer whom she had not seen in four years and whom she believed to be, if he was, still lived and breathed at all, a thousand miles away. And then the two of them, the two accursed children on whom the first blow of their devil's heritage had but that moment fallen, looking at one another across the upraised and unfinished wedding dress. Twelve miles toward that I rode beside an animal who could stand in the street before my house and bellow placidly to the populous and listening solitude that my nephew had just murdered his sister's fiancé, yet who could not permit himself to force the mule which drew us beyond a walk, because it warn't none of mine nor his neither, and besides it ain't had a decent bait of victuals since the corn give out in February, who, turning into the actual gate at last, must stop the mule and pointing with the whip and spitting first, say, it was right yonder. What was right there, fool? I cried, and he, it was, until I took the whip from him into my own hand and struck the mule. But they cannot tell you how I went on up the drive, past Ellen's ruined and weed-choked flower beds, and reached the house, the shell, the, so I thought, cocoon casket marriage bed of youth and grief, and found that I had come, not too late as I had thought, but come too soon. Rotting portico and scaling walls, it stood, not ravaged, not invaded, marked by no bullet nor soldier's iron heel, but rather as though reserved for something more, some desolation more profound than ruin as if it had stood in iron juxtaposition to iron flame, to a holocaust which had found itself less fierce and less implacable, not hurled but rather fallen back before the impervious and indomitable skeleton which the flames durst not, at the instant's final crisis, assail. There was even one step, one plank rotted free and tilting beneath the foot, or would have if I had not touched it light and fast, as I ran up and into the hallway whose carpet had long since gone with the bed and table linen for lint, and saw the sup and face, and even as I cried, Henry, Henry, what have you done? What has that fool been trying to tell me? Realized that I had come not too late as I had thought, but come too soon. Because it was not Henry's face. It was sup and face enough, but not his. Sup and coffee-colored face enough there in the dim light, barring the stairs, and I running out of the bright afternoon into the thunderous silence of that brooding house where I could see nothing at first, then gradually the face, the Sutpen face not approaching, not swimming up out of the gloom, but already there, rock-like and firm and antedating time and house and doom and all. Waiting there. Oh, yes, he chose well. He bettered choosing who created in his own image the cold Cerberus of his private hell. The face without sex or age, because it had never possessed either. The same sphinx face which she had been born with, which had looked down from the loft that night beside Judith's, and which she still wears now at seventy-four, looking at me with no change, no alteration in it at all, as though it had known to the second when I was to enter had waited there during that entire twelve miles behind that walking mule, and watched me draw nearer and nearer, and enter the door at last, as it had known, ah, perhaps decreed, since there is that justice whose Moloch's pallet paunch makes no distinction between gristle bone and tender flesh, that I should, the face stopping me dead, not my body, it still advanced, ran on, but I myself, that deep existence which we lead, to which the movement of limbs is but a clumsy and belated accompaniment like so many unnecessary instruments played crudely and amateurishly out of time to the tune itself. In that barren hall with its naked stare, that carpet gone too, 
rising into the dim upper hallway, where an echo spoke which was not mine, but rather that of the lost, irrevocable might have been which haunts all houses, all enclosed walls erected by human hands, not for shelter, not for warmth, but to hide from the world's curious looking and seeing the dark turnings which the ancient young delusions of pride and hope and ambition, ay, and love too, take. Judith, I said, Judith. There was no answer. I had expected none. Possibly even then I did not expect Judith to answer, just as a child, before the full instant of comprehended terror, calls on the parent whom it actually knows, this before the terror destroys all judgment whatever, is not even there to hear it. I was crying not to someone, something, but trying to cry, through something, through that force, that furious yet absolutely rock-like and immobile antagonism which had stopped me. That presence, that familiar coffee-colored face, that body, the bare coffee-colored feet motionless on the bare floor, the curve of the stair rising just beyond her. No larger than my own, which, without moving, with no alteration of visual displacement whatever, she did not even remove her gaze from mine for the reason that she was not looking at me but through me, apparently still musing upon the open door's serene rectangle which I had broken, seemed to elongate and project upward something— not soul, not spirit, but something rather of a profoundly attentive and distracted listening to or for something, which I myself could not hear and was not intended to hear. A brooding awareness and acceptance of the inexplicable unseen inherited from an older and a purer race than mine, which created, postulated, and shaped in the empty air between us that which I believed I had come to find, nay, which I must find, else breathing and standing there I would have denied that I was ever born. That bedroom long closed and musty, that sheetless bed, that nuptial couch of love and grief, with the pale and bloody corpse in its patched and weathered gray crimson in the bare mattress, the bowed and unwived widow kneeling beside it, and I, my body not stopping yet, yes, it needed the hand, the touch for that, I, self-mesmered fool, who still believed that what must be would be, could not but be, else I must deny sanity as well as breath, running, hurling myself into that inscrutable coffee-colored face, that cold, implacable, mindless, no, not mindless, anything but mindless, his own clairvoyant will tempered to amoral evils undeviate and absolute by the black will and blood with which he had crossed it, replica of his own, which he had created and decreed to preside upon his absence, as you might watch a wild, distracted, night-bound bird flutter into the brazen and fatal lamp. Wait, she said, don't you go up there. Still I did not stop. It would require the hand. And I still running on, accomplishing those last few feet across which we seemed to glare at one another, not as two faces, but as the two abstract contradictions which we actually were. Neither of our voices raised, as though we spoke to one another free of the limitations and restrictions of speech and hearing. What? I said. Don't you go up there, Rosa. That was how she said it. That quiet, that still. And again it was as though it had not been she who spoke, but the house itself that said the words. The house which he had built which some suppuration of himself had created about him as the sweat of his body might have created, produced, some, even if invisible, cocoon-like and complementary shell in which Ellen had had to live and die a stranger, in which Henry and Judith would have to be victims and prisoners or die. Because it was not the name, the word, the fact that she had called me Rosa. As children she had called me that, just as she had called them Henry and Judith. I knew that even now she still called Judith, and Henry too when she spoke of him, by her given name. And she might very naturally have called me Rosa still, since to everyone else whom I knew I was still a child. But it was not that. That was not what she meant at all. In fact, during that instant while we stood face to face, that instant before my still advancing body should brush past her and reach the stair, she did me more grace and respect than anyone else I knew. I knew that from the instant I had entered that door, 
To her, of all who knew me, I was no child. Rosa, I cried, to me, to my face. Then she touched me, and then I did stop dead. Possibly even then my body did not stop, since I seemed to be aware of it thrust and blindly still against the solid yet imponderable weight, she not owner, instrument, I still say that, of that will to bar me from the stairs. Possibly the sound of the other voice, the single word spoken from the stair head above us, had already broken and parted us before it, my body, had even paused. I do not know. I know only that my entire being seemed to run at blind full tilt into something monstrous and immobile, with a shock and impact too soon and too quick to be mere amazement and outrage at that black, arresting and untimorous hand on my white woman's flesh. Because there is something in the touch of flesh with flesh which abrogates, cut sharp and straight across the devious, intricate channels of decorous ordering, which enemies as well as lovers know because it makes them both. Touch and touch of that which is the citadel of the central I am's private own, not spirit, soul. The licorice and ungirdled mind is anyone's to take in any darkened hallway of this earthly tenement. But let flesh touch with flesh, and watch the fall of all the eggshell shibboleth of caste and color, too. Yes, I stopped dead. No woman's hand, no negro's hand, but bitted bridle curb to check and guide the furious and unbending will. I cry not to her, to it. Speaking to it through the negro, the woman, only because of the shock which was not yet outrage, because it would be terror soon, expecting and receiving no answer, because we both knew it was not to her I spoke. Take your hand off me, nigger. I got none. We just stood there, I motionless in the attitude and action of running, she rigid in that furious immobility, the two of us joined by that hand and arm which held us, like a fierce, rigid umbilical cord, twin-sistered to the fell darkness which had produced her. As a child I had more than once watched her and Judith and even Henry scuffling in the rough games which they, possibly all children I do not know, played, and, so I have heard, she and Judith even slept together, in the same room but with Judith in the bed and she on a pallet on the floor, ostensibly. But I have heard how on more than one occasion Ellen has found them both on the pallet, and once in the bed together. But not I. Even as a child I would not even play with the same objects which she and Judith played with, as though that warped and spartan solitude which I called my childhood, which had taught me, and little else, to listen before I could comprehend and to understand before I even heard, had also taught me not only to instinctively fear her and what she was, but to shun the very objects which she had touched. We stood there so. And then suddenly it was not outrage that I waited for, out of which I had instinctively cried. It was not terror. It was some cumulative overreach of despair itself. I remember how, as we stood there joined by that volitionless, yes, it too sentient victim, just as she and I were, hand, I cried, perhaps not aloud, not with words, and not to Judith, mind, perhaps I knew already, on the instant I entered the house and saw that face which was at once both more and less than Sutpen, perhaps I knew even then what I could not, would not, must not believe. I cried, and you too, and you too, sister, sister? What did I expect? I, self-mesmered fool, come twelve miles expecting what? Henry, perhaps, to emerge from some door which knew his touch, his hand on the knob, the weight of his foot on a sill which knew that weight. And so to find standing in the hall a small, plain, frightened creature whom neither man nor woman had ever looked at twice, whom he had not seen himself in four years, and seldom enough before that, but whom he would recognize if only because of the worn brown silk which had once become his mother, and because the creature stood there calling him by his given name, Henry, to emerge and say, Why, it's Rosa, Aunt Rosa, wake up, Aunt Rosa, wake up. Ah, the dreamer, clinging yet to the dream as the patient clings to the last thin, unbearable, ecstatic instant of agony, in order to sharpen the savor of the pain's surcease. 
waken into the reality, the more than reality, not to the unchanged and unaltered old time, but into a time altered to fit the dream, which, conjunctive with the dreamer, becomes immolated and apotheosized. Mother and Judith are in the nursery with the children, and Father and Charles are walking in the garden. Wake up, Aunt Rosa, wake up! Or not expect, perhaps, not even hope, not even dream, since dreams don't come in pairs. And had I not come twelve miles, drawn not by mortal mule, but by some chimera foal of nightmare's very self? Ah, wake up, Rosa, wake up! Not from what was, what used to be, but from what had not, could not have ever been. Wake, Rosa, not to what should, what might have been, but to what cannot, what must not be. Wake, Rosa, from the hopin, who did believe there is a seemliness to bereavement even though grief be absent. Believe there would be need for you to save, not love, perhaps, not happiness nor peace, but what was left behind by widowin, and found that there was nothing there to save. Who hoped to save her as you promised Ellen? Not Charles Bond, not Henry, not either one of these from him or even from one another. And now too late who would have been too late if you had come there from the womb, or had been there already at the full, strong, capable mortal peak when she was born, who came twelve miles and nineteen years to save what did not need the saving, and lost instead yourself. I do not know, except that I did not find it. I found only that dream state in which you run without moving from a terror in which you cannot believe, toward a safety in which you have no faith held so not by the shifting and foundationless quicksand of nightmare, but by a face which was its soul's own inquisitor, a hand which was the agent of its own crucifixion, until the voice parted us, broke the spell. It said one word, Clyte, like that, that cold, that still, not Judith, but the house itself speaking again, though it was Judith's voice. Oh, I knew it well, who had believed in Grieven's seemliness. I knew it as well as she, Clyte, knew it. She did not move. It was only the hand, the hand gone before I realized that it had been removed. I do not know if she removed it or if I ran out from beneath its touch, but it was gone. And this, too, they cannot tell you, how I ran, fled up the stairs, and found no grieven widowed bride but Judith standing before the closed door to that chamber, in the gingham dress which she had worn each time I had seen her since Ellen died, holding something in one hanging hand. And if there had been grief or anguish, she had put them two away, complete or not complete I do not know, along with that unfinished wedding dress. Yes, Rosa, she said, like that again and I stopped in runnin's mid-stride again, though my body, blind, unsentient barrow of deluded clay and breath, still advanced. And how I saw that what she held in that lax and negligent hand was the photograph, the picture of herself in its metal case which she had given him, held casual and forgotten against her flank as any interrupted pastime book. That's what I found. Perhaps it's what I expected, knew, even at nineteen knew, I would say if it were not for my nineteen, my own particular kind of nineteen years, that I should find. Perhaps I couldn't even have wanted more than that, couldn't have accepted less, who even at nineteen must have known that living is one constant and perpetual instant when the heiress veil before what is to be hangs docile and even glad to the lightest naked thrust if we had dared were brave enough, not wise enough, no wisdom needed here, to make the rending gash. Or perhaps it is no lack of courage either, not cowardice which will not face that sickness somewhere at the prime foundation of this factual scheme, from which the prisoner soul, miasmal distillant, roils ever upward, sunward, tugs its tenuous prisoner arteries and veins, and prisoning in its turn that spark, that dream which, as the globy and complete instant of its freedom mirrors and repeats, repeats, creates, reduces to a fragile evanescent iridescent sphere, all of space and time and massy earth, 
relics the seething and anonymous miasmal mass which in all the years of time has taught itself no boon of death but only how to recreate, renew, and dies, is gone, vanished, nothing. But is that true wisdom which can comprehend that there is a might have been which is more true than truth, from which the dreamer wakened says not, Did I but dream? but rather says, in diet's high heaven's very self, with, Why did I wake, since waken I shall never sleep again? Once there was... Do you mark how the wisteria, sun impacted on this wall here, distills and penetrates this room as though light unimpeded, by secret and attritive progress from moat to moat of obscurity's myriad components? That is the substance of remembering, sense, sight, smell, the muscles with which we see and hear and feel, not mind, not thought. There is no such thing as memory. The brain recalls just what the muscles grope for, no more, no less, and its resultant sum is usually incorrect and false and worthy only of the name of dream. See how the sleep and outflung hand, touching the bedside candle, remembers pain, springs back and free while mind and brain sleep on, and only make of this adjacent heat some trashy myth of reality's escape. Or that same sleeping hand in sensuous marriage with some dulcet surface is transformed by that same sleeping brain and mind into that same figment stuff warped out of all experience. Ah, grief goes, fades, we know that but ask the tear ducts if they have forgotten how to weep. Once there was, they cannot have told you this either, a summer of wisteria. It was a pervading everywhere of wisteria. I was fourteen then, as though of all springs yet to capitulate, condensed into one spring, one summer. The spring and summertime, which is every female's who breathed above dust, Beholden of all betrayed springs, held over from all irrevocable time, repercussed, bloomed again. It was a vintage year of wisteria, vintage year being that sweet conjunction of root bloom and urge and hour and weather. And I, I was fourteen, I will not insist on bloom at whom no man had yet to look, nor would ever twice, as not as child but less than even child as not more child than woman, but even as less than any female flesh. Nor do I say leaf, warped, bitter, pale, and crimped, half-fledgling, intimidate of any claim to green which might have drawn to it the tender mayfly childhood sweetheart games, or given pause to the male predacious wasps and bees of later lust. But root and urge I do insist in claim, for had I not erred too from all the unsisted eaves since the snake? Yes, urge I do, warped chrysalis of what blind, perfect seed. For who shall say what gnarled, forgotten root might not bloom yet with some globed concentrate, more globed and concentrate and heady perfect, because the neglected root was planted, warped, and lay not dead, but merely slept, forgot? That was the miscast summer of my barren youth, which— for that short time, that short brief, unreturning springtime of the female heart, I lived out not as a woman, a girl, but rather as the man which I perhaps should have been. I was fourteen then, fourteen in years, if they could have been called years, while in that unpaced corridor which I called childhood, which was not living but rather some projection of the lightless womb itself. I, gestate and complete, not aged, just overdue because of some caesarean lack, some cold head-nuzzling forceps of the savage time which should have torn me free, I waited not for light but for that doom which we call female victory, which is, endure and then endure, without rhyme or reason or hope of reward, and then endure. I like that blind subterranean fish, that insulated spark whose origin the fish no longer remembers which pulses and beats at its crepuscular and lethargic tenement, with the old unsleeping itch which has no words to speak with other than this was called light, that smell, that touch, that other something which has bequeathed not even name for sound of bee or bird or flower scent or light or sun or love. Yes, not even growing and developing, beloved by and loving light, 
but equipped only with that cunning, that inverted canker growth of solitude which substitutes the omnivorous and unrational hearing sense for all the others. So that instead of accomplishing the processional and measured milestones of the normal childhood's time, I lurked, unapprehended as though shod with the very damp and velvet silence of the womb, I displaced no air, gave off no betraying sound, from one closed forbidden door to the next, and so acquired all I knew of that light and space in which people moved and breathed, as I, that same child, might have gained conception of the sun from seeing it through a piece of smoky glass. Fourteen, four years younger than Judith, four years later than Judith's moment, which only virgins know. When the entire delicate spirit's bent is one anonymous climaxless epicene and unravished nuptial, not that widowed and nightly violation by the inescapable and scornful dead which is the meed of twenty and thirty and forty, but a world filled with living marriage like the light and air which she breathes. But it was no summer of a virgin's itch and discontent, no summer's caesarean lack which should have torn me, dead flesh or even embryo, from the living, or else by friction's ravishing of the male furrowed meat, also weaponed and panoplied as a man instead of hollow woman. It was the summer after that first Christmas that Henry brought him home, the summer following the two days of that June vacation which he spent at Sutpen's Hundred, before he rode on to the river to take the steamboat home, that summer after my aunt left and Papa had to go away on business, and I was sent out to Ellen, Possibly my father chose Ellen as a refuge for me, because at that time Thomas Sutman was also absent, to stay so that she could take care of me, who had been born too late, born into some curious disjoint of my father's life and left on his, now twice widowed hands, I competent enough to reach a kitchen shelf, count spoons and hem a sheet and measure milk into a churn, yet good for nothing else, yet still too valuable to be left alone. I had never seen him. I never saw him. I never even saw him dead. I heard a name. I saw a photograph. I helped to make a grave. And that was all. Though he had been in my house once, that first New Year's Day, when Henry brought him from nephew duty to speak to me on their way back to school, and I was not at home. Until then I had not even heard his name, did not know that he existed. Yet on the day when I went out there to stay that summer, it was as though that casual pause at my door had left some seed, some minute virulence in this cellar earth of mine, quick not for love, perhaps. I did not love him, how could I? I had never even heard his voice, had only Ellen's word for it that there was such a person. And quick not for the spying, which you will doubtless call it, which during the past six months between that New Year's and that June gave substance to that shadow with a name emerging from Ellen's vain and garrulous folly, that shape without even a face yet because I had not even seen the photograph then, reflected in the secret and bemused gaze of a young girl, because I who had learned nothing of love, not even parents' love, that fond, dear, constant violation of privacy, that stultification of the burgeoning and incorrigible eye which is the mead and dew of all mammalian meat, became not mistress, not beloved, but more than even love. I became all polymath love's androgynous advocate. There must have been some seed he left to cause a child's vacant fairy tale to come alive in that garden, because I was not spying when I would follow her. I was not spying, though you will say I was. And even if it was spying, it was not jealousy, because I did not love him. How could I have when I had never seen him? And even if I did, not as woman love, as Judith loved him, or as we thought she did. If it was love, and I still say, how could it be? It was the way that mothers love when, punishing the child, she strikes not it, but through it strikes the neighbor boy whom it has just whipped or been whipped by, caresses not the rewarded child, but rather the nameless man or woman who gave the palm-sweated penny, but not as women love. Because I asked nothing of him, you see. And more than that, I gave him nothing which is the sum of lovin'. Why, I didn't even miss him. I don't know even now if I was ever aware that I had seen nothing of his face but that photograph that shadow, that picture in the young girl's bedroom. 
a picture casual and framed upon a littered dressing table, yet bowered and dressed, or so I thought, with all the maiden and invisible lily roses, because even before I saw the photograph I could have recognized, nay, described the very face. But I never saw it. I do not even know of my own knowledge that Ellen ever saw it, that Judith ever loved it, that Henry slew it. So who will dispute me when I say, Why did I not invent, create it? And I know this. If I were God, I would invent out of this seething turmoil we call progress something, a machine, perhaps, which would adorn the barren mirror altars of every plain girl who breathes with such as this, which is so little since we want so little, this pictured face. It would not even need a skull behind it, almost anonymous. It would only need vague inference of some walk in flesh and blood desired by someone else, even if only in some shadow realm of make-believe. A picture seen by stealth, by creeping. My childhood taught me that instead of love, and it stood me in good stead. In fact, if it had taught me love, love could not have stood me so. Into the deserted midday room to look at it. Not to dream, since I dwelt in the dream, but to renew, rehearse, the part as the faulty though eager amateur might steal wingward in some interim of the visible scene to hear the prompter's momentary voice. And if jealousy, not man's jealousy, the jealousy of the lover, not even the lover's self who spies from love, who spies to watch, taste, touch that maiden reverie of solitude which is the first thinning of that veil we call virginity, not to spring out, force that shame which is such a part of love's declaring, but to gloat upon the rich instantaneous bosom already rosy with the flushy sleep, though shame itself does not yet need to wake. No, it was not that. I was not spying, who would walk those raked and sanded garden paths and think, this print was his, save for this obliterating rake, that even despite the rake it is still there, and hers beside it in that slow and mutual rhythm wherein the heart, the mind, does not need to watch the docile, ah, the willing feet, would think, what suspiration of the twinning souls have the murmurous myriad ears of this secluded vine or shrub listened to? What vow, what promise, what rapt biden fire has the lilac rain of this wisteria, this heavy rose's dissolution crowned? But best of all, better far than this, the actual living and the dreamy flesh itself. Oh no, I was not spying while I dreamed in the lurking harborage of my own shrub or vine, as I believed she dreamed upon the nooky seat which held invisible imprint of his absent thighs, just as the obliterating sand, the million finger nerves of frond and leaf, the very sun and moony constellations which had looked down at him, the circumambient air, held somewhere yet his foot, his passing shape, his face, his speaking voice, his name, Charles Bon, Charles Good, Charles Husband soon to be. No, not spying not even Hyden, who was child enough not to need to hide, whose presence would have been no violation even though he sat with her, yet woman enough to have gone to her entitled to be received, perhaps with pleasure, gratitude, into that maiden shameless confidence where young girls talk of love. Yes, child enough to go to her and say, Let me sleep with you, woman enough to say, Let us lie in bed together while you tell me what love is. Yet who did not do it, because I should have had to say, Don't talk to me of love, but let me tell you, who know already more of love than you will ever know or need. Then my father returned and came for me and took me home, and I became again that nondescript too long a child, yet too short a woman, in the fitless garments which my aunt had left behind, keeping a fitless house, who was not spying, hiding, but waiting, watching for no reward, no thanks, who did not love him in the sense we mean it, because there is no love of that sort without hope, who, if it were love, loved with that sort beyond the compass of glib books, that love which gives up what it never had, that penny's modicum which is the donor's all, yet whose infinitesimal weight adds nothing to the substance of the loved. And yet I gave it, and not to him, to her, it was as though I said to her, Here, take this too. You cannot love him as he should be loved, 
and though he will no more feel this given's weight than he would ever know its lack, yet there may come some moment in your married lives when he will find this Adam's particle as you might find a cramped small pallid hidden shoot in a familiar flower bed, and pause and say, Where did this come from? You need only answer, I don't know. And then I went back home and stayed five years, heard an echoed shot, ran up a nightmare flight of steps, and found, why, a woman, standing calmly in a gingham dress before a closed door which she would not allow me to enter. A woman more strange to me than any grief, for being so less its partner. A woman saying, Yes, Rosa, calmly into the mid-stride of my running, which, I know it now, had begun five years ago, since he had been in my house too and had left no more trace than he had left in Ellen's, where he had been but a sheep, a shadow, not of a man, a being, but of some esoteric piece of furniture, vase or chair or desk, which Ellen wanted, as though his very impression or lack of it on cold field or sutpen walls held portentous prophecy of what was to be. Yes, running out of that first year, that year before the war, during which Ellen talked to me of Trousseau, and it my Trousseau, of all the dreamy panoply of surrender which was my surrender, which had so little to surrender that it was all I had, because there is that might have been which is the single rock we cling to above the maelstrom of unbearable reality. The four years while I believed she waited as I waited, while the stable world which we had been taught to know dissolved in fire and smoke, until peace and security were gone, and pride and hope, and there was left only mean Donna's veterans and love. Yes, there should, there must be love and faith. These left with us by fathers, husbands, sweethearts, brothers, who carried the pride and the hope of peace and honor's vanguard as they did the flags. There must be these, else what do men fight for? What else worth dying for? Yes, die not for honor's empty sake, nor pride, nor even peace but for that love and faith they left behind. Because he was to die, I know that, knew that, as both pride and peace were. Else how to prove love's immortality? But not love, not faith itself, themselves. Love without hope, perhaps, faith with little to be proud with. But love and faith at least above the murdering and the folly, to salvage at least from the humbled, indicted dust something away of the old lost enchantment of the heart. Yes, found her standing before that closed door which I was not to enter, and which she herself did not enter again to my knowledge until Jones and the other man carried the coffin up the stairs, with the photograph hanging at her side and her face absolutely calm, looking at me for a moment and just raising her voice enough to be heard in the hall below. Clyde, Miss Rosa will be here for dinner. You had better get out some more meal. Then, shall we go downstairs? I will have to speak to Mr. Jones about some planks and nails. That was all, or rather not all, since there is no all, no finish. It not the blow we suffer from, but the tedious repercussive anticlimax of it, the rubbishy aftermath to clear away from off the very threshold of despair. This book is continued on Disc 5. Disc 5 That was all, or rather not all, since there is no all, no finish. It not the blow we suffer from, but the tedious repercussive anticlimax of it, the rubbishy aftermath to clear away from off the very threshold of despair. You see, I never saw him. I never even saw him dead. I heard an echo, but not the shot. I saw a closed door, but did not enter it. I remember how that afternoon when we carried the coffin from the house, Jones and another white man which he produced, exhumed from somewhere, made it of boards torn from the carriage house. I remember how while we ate the food which Judith, yes, Judith, the same face calm, cold, and tranquil above the stove, had cooked, ate it in the very room which he lay over, we could hear them hammering and sawing in the backyard and how I saw Judith once in a faded gingham sunbonnet to match the dress, giving them directions about making it. I remember how during all that slow and sunny afternoon they hammered and sawed right under the back parlor window, the slow maddening rasp, rasp, rasp of the saw, the flat, deliberate hammer blows, 
that seemed as though each would be the last, but was not. Repeated and resumed just when the dulled attenuation of the wearied nerves stretched beyond all resiliency, relaxed to silence, and then had to scream again, until at last I went out there, and saw Judith in the barn lot in a cloud of chickens, her apron cradled about the gathered eggs, and asked them why, why there, why must it be just there? And they both stopped long and more than long enough for Jones to turn and spit again and say, because it wouldn't be so fur to tote the box, and how before my very back was turned he, one of them, added further, out of some amazed and fumbling ratiocination of inertia, how it would be simpler yet to fetch him down and nail the planks around him, only maybe Mrs. Judy wouldn't like it. I remember how as we carried him down the stairs and down to the waiting wagon I tried to take the full weight of the coffin to prove to myself that he was really in it, and I could not tell. I was one of his pallbearers, yet I could not, would not, believe something which I knew could not but be so. Because I never saw him, you see. There are some things which happen to us which the intelligence and the senses refuse, just as the stomach sometimes refuses what the palate has accepted, but which digestion cannot compass. Occurrences which stop us dead as though by some impalpable intervention, like a sheet of glass through which we watch all subsequent events transpire, as though in a soundless vacuum, and fade and vanish, are gone, leaving us immobile, impotent, helpless, fixed until we can die. That was I. I was there. Something of me walked in measured cadence with the measured tread of Jones and his companion, and Theophilus McCaslin, who had heard the news somehow back in town, and Clyte, as we bore the awkward and unmanageable box past the stairs close turning, while Judith, following, steadied it from behind, and so down and out to the wagon. Something of me helped to raise that which it could not have raised alone, yet which it still could not believe, into the waiting wagon. Something of me stood beside the gashy earth in the cedar's somber gloom, and heard the clumsy knell of clods upon the wood, and answered no when Judith at the grave's mounded end said, he was a Catholic. Do any of you all know how Catholics? And Theophilus McCaslin said, Catholic be damned, he was a soldier, and I can pray for any Confederate soldier. And then cried in his old man's shrill, harsh, loud, cacophonous voice, Yea, Forrest! Yea, John Sartorus! Yea! And something walked with Judith and Clyte back across that sunset field, and answered in some curious, serene suspension to the serene, quiet voice which talked of plowing corn and cutting winter wood. And in the lamplit kitchen helped this time to cook the meal, and helped to eat it too within the room beyond whose ceiling he no longer lay, and went to bed, yes, took a candle from that firm and trembling hand, and thought she did not even weep, and then in a lamp-gloomed mirror saw my own face and thought, nor did you either. Within that house where he had sojourned for another brief and this time final space, and left no trace of him, not even tears. Yes, one day he was not, then he was, then he was not. It was too short, too fast, too quick. Six hours of a summer afternoon saw it all a space too short to leave even the imprint of a body on a mattress, and blood can come from anywhere, if there was blood since I never saw him. For all I was allowed to know, we had no corpse. We even had no murderer. We did not even speak of Henry that day, not one of us. I did not say, the aunt, the spinster, did he look well or ill. I did not say one of the thousand trivial things with which the indomitable woman blood ignores the man's world in which the blood kinsman shows the courage or cowardice, the folly or lust or fear for which his fellows praise or crucify him, who came and crashed a door and cried his crime and vanished, who for the fact that he was still alive was just that much more shadowy than the abstraction which we had nailed into a box. A shot heard only by its echo, a strange, gaunt, half-wild horse, bridled and with empty saddle, the saddle-bags containing a pistol, a worn, clean shirt, a lump of iron like bread, captured by a man four miles away and two days later while trying to force the crib door in his stable. Yes, more than that. He was absent, and he was. He returned, and he was not. Three women put something into the earth and covered it. 
and he had never been. Now you will ask me why I stayed there. I could say I do not know, could give ten thousand paltry reasons, all untrue and be believed, that I stayed for food, who could have combed ditch banks and weed beds, made and worked a garden as well at my own home in town as here, not to speak of neighbors, friends whose arms I might have accepted, since necessity has a way of obliterating from our conduct various delicate scruples regarding honor and pride, that I stayed for shelter, who had a roof of my own in fee simple now indeed, or that I stayed for company, who at home could have had the company of neighbors who were at least of my own kind, who had known me all my life and even longer in the sense that they thought not only as I thought but as my forebears.